Neato, nice, easy downers. Withdrawal from barbiturates can cause convulsions. Well, you can convulse yourself out of here. Grass. Anything wrong with pot? They're not sure yet. They just started studying about it. Worry wart. Dig, everybody. L, S, D. There can hurt you, can't it? Sure, kid. Why do you think they call it dope? Yeah. Hey, where's everybody going? Mitch is all business. The free ride is over. If David wants more reds, it'll cost him. He'll have to come up with the bread. How? That's his business. Everyone else is doing it. If David wants to be one of the crowd, he'll have to fall in line. David doesn't want to be left out to lose his newfound friends. And he does consider Henry and Mitch his friends. He assures them he'll get the money. He saved his allowance, but it wasn't enough. He started to hoard the money his mother gave him for juice with his school lunch. And he went without. And he began to steal coins from his mother's purse. Pooling all the money he could lay his hands on, his allowance, his lunch money, and what he could pilfer, David soon has saved several dollars. And when his mother treats him to a movie, he adds this money as well. By now, he has enough for a sizable score. David's eager to see Mitch, and Henry agrees to take him to a place where his brother often hangs out with his friends to smoke pot or drop some pills. Turn on. Mr. O.D. Is she dead? Yeah. Come on. What? She was Mitch's girl. Shouldn't we? Look, don't you think. Don't you dare think. The next day, school, going to classes, being with the other kids is a nightmare for David, pretending nothing had happened while carrying the burden of his terrible knowledge. He's disturbed, shaken, He's afraid, but he doesn't know what to do. He feels he must tell someone what he knows, and yet he doesn't want to rat on his new friends. Henry realizes that David is uptight about the whole thing. He tries to put him at ease. He even offers him a couple of reds for free to make his problems go away, but David declines. Mitch has been arrested, busted. They're taking him away. Someone had talked. Someone told about Karen. She hadn't been able to get a big enough or quick enough high. She'd taken an overdose. Mitch had been supplying her. The thoughts are whirling around in David's head. Henry, Karen, Mitch, 
the realization of the grave consequences of getting mixed up with drugs and narcotics crowds in on him. Hey, good catch. Yeah. That's one way of getting it around. What? Narcotics information. Oh. Did you read it? No. Why not? You might learn something. Like what? Like what it's all about. How come you know so much about it? How? I was a user. No more. I quit before I got hooked for good. I found out the facts about drugs. It's right here. Let's take a walk. You know, to be a user or not to be a user is one of the most important decisions you'll ever have to make. And the decision is yours, and yours alone. Isn't it worth getting at the truth before making it? Yeah, I guess so. Once you've turned on, you don't know anymore when you get really hooked. When it becomes impossible for you to stop, the best thing is never to start. Second best, if you're on something, get off. Now, and stay off. Yeah, if it's hard stuff. But just smoking grass, that's no worse than smoking cigarettes or taking a drink. That's supposed to be bad for you, too. But people still do it, so why not pot? Oh, come on, don't give me that. You know better. Sure smoking's bad for you. Sure drinking too much can mess you up. Everybody knows that. But is that any reason to start on one more stupid hang-up, like smoking grass or turning on? What's so bad about pot? Okay, let's go over it together. Marijuana, pot, is a weed that grows wild in many parts of the world. It's an Indian hemp plant called cannabis sativa. All of it, the leaf, the stem, and the seeds can be used for smoking. The effects on a smoker depends on the quality and the amount of pot smoked. Everyone reacts in a different way to it, and there's no telling how it will affect you. You lose touch with the real world. Your senses become distorted and you can't function normally, and your judgment of what you're doing becomes faulty and that can be very dangerous. Pot may not be physically addictive, like the hard stuff, but you come to depend on it. After a while, you've just got to have it. In that way, it is like smoking cigarettes. Have you ever seen a heavy smoker trying to quit? Well, it's like that, only more so, much more so. And as for your drinking bit, blowing pot can make you act just as rattle-brained as if you were drunk. If you blow pot regularly, after a while, you get a real I-don't-care attitude about everything. Just think what would happen if everyone had that kind of an attitude. There are times when every one of us has to depend on someone else. I'm sure you've had to. Suppose, suppose they had the I-don't-care attitude of a pot smoker when you needed them. Some scientists who have studied the effects of pot smoking say it's very bad for you. Others say it's not. But one thing they do agree on it isn't good for you. We'll have to wait for more tests before we'll know just how bad it is. If you blow pot, you take a chance of blowing your whole future. What's the sense in doing that? But isn't it good for something? Negative, man. Marijuana has no medical use. Like pills do, for instance. Yeah, what about pills? Doctors give them to people. There can't be any harm in them. Depends. Not when they're prescribed by a doctor to help cure some illness. There's a big, fat difference between taking drugs on prescription to get well and taking them for kicks to get high. A doctor has had years of training. When he gives you a pill, he knows why you need it, he knows what and how much to give you, and he knows what it'll do to you. What do you think a dealer knows about things like that? His lack of knowledge may cost you. Pills and caps fall into two main categories, amphetamines, uppers, and barbiturates, downers. Uppers are stimulants that directly affect your central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord. They come in many shapes and colors with slang names such as bennies, dexies, and hearts. Often they're bought on the street, rolled in tinfoil. One of the most dangerous, methadrine, also called meth or speed, comes in both tablet and powder form. It's very, very true that speed kills. It has, many times. Under a doctor's care, amphetamines and barbiturates are used to treat various medical problems. But taken for kicks, it's another story. Unchecked abuse may lead to dependency, even addiction. The user becomes confused, 
aggressive, irrational, and reckless. In bad cases, it may even lead to a serious mental disorder. Barbiturates, downers, are depressants, the opposite of uppers, and even more dangerous. One of the most dangerous is secanol, reds. There are many downers on the market with slang names such as reds, yellows, pink ladies, blue heavens, and rainbows. Downers are addictive. You have to have more and more of the drug because your body gets used to it until you may well take an overdose, OD. More people died from downer ODs in the United States one year than were killed by guns. Sure, popping pills may feel great at the moment, but in the end, it'll destroy you. A dealer will try to get you hooked on something that'll make you come back to him, like reds. He'll tell you that you'll get a bigger high from stronger stuff, LSD, even heroin. It becomes easier to go on to the next step all the time. LSD is a very powerful and very destructive hallucinogen. It comes in tablet or powder form or as a liquid, and it is most often taken by mouth, perhaps over a sugar cube. The effect on the mind is frightening, completely unpredictable. The trip can be the hope for heaven, or it can be a hell of horrors from which you may never return. A lot of young people have become permanently deranged through a single terrifying trip or have destroyed themselves while freaking out. Neither LSD nor heroin has any real medical uses. Heroin addiction is the end of the road for the user. The way back is almost impossible. Withdrawal from the deadly narcotic is extremely dangerous and painful. A heroin high may put you six feet under. And think about this. Nearly every heroin addict began by blowing pot, and every last one of them never thought that he'd go on to the hard stuff. That's something that happens to the other guy. And here's something else to consider. From pot to heroin, it's against the law to possess it, to sell it, to give it away, even to be in a place where illegal drugs or narcotics are being used. You can be arrested. Get yourself a police record that may hurt you all your life and it's just plain stupid to blame the police officer, like some heads do. He's only doing the job that we, the people, have hired him to do, upholding the laws that protect us all. It makes a lot more sense to help him. How? Well, you may feel that you don't want to tell on your friends, but maybe that kind of loyalty is misplaced. The fact is, the dealer who wants to turn you on is not your friend. He will abandon you at once if there's trouble. Drug friendships are not real friendships. Who's really your friend? The one who wants to get you on self-destructive drugs? Who's eager to mess up your life? Or the one who wants to steer you clear of them? To point out the very real dangers to you, honestly. Using narcotics or abusing drugs is nothing but a cop-out from life, an escape from having to face up to everyday problems. Everyone has hang-ups and problems. Growing up means learning to cope with them. They don't go away by themselves, and drugs only make them worse. By using them, we only deny ourselves the ability to become mature and responsible and have a chance of real happiness. Drug addicts, on the average, live 20 to 25 years less than they would if they didn't pollute their bodies and minds with narcotics. We all know how the Earth is being polluted. You don't believe in pollution, do you? Polluting the water and the soil and the air? Of course not. You want it stopped? Sure. What are you doing about it? You kidding? What can I do? Well, for one thing, one very important thing, you can decide not to pollute your own body. The pollution that's being blown into the atmosphere every day, following the air we breathe, is no different from the pollution you draw into your lungs when you smoke pot. The sewage being dropped into the water, polluting and poisoning it, is really no different than the drugs you put into your body when you drop pills or acid. If you had an aquarium with beautiful fish in it, you wouldn't pour poison into it, would you? Then why put poison into your own body? You never really know what's in the drugs or narcotics you get. Most dealers don't know themselves. They're in it to make a buck. A lot of the stuff has all kinds of junk mixed into it. To make it stretch further, you can be sure of only one thing. It will pollute your body and your mind. If you're smart, you'll say no to drugs. You'll say no to this chemical cop-out. Yeah, but who wants to be called chicken? Chicken? Who's really chicken? The guy who must go along with the crowd at any cost? 
or the guy who has the guts to take a stand for what he knows is right, even if it's not the popular thing to do. Think about it, man. Think about it. David is impressed. He has been given a lot to think about. He's promised his mother to pick up his brother Eddie at the grade school, his old school. But when he gets there, he doesn't see him around. He learns that Eddie and a couple of his friends went on down to a construction site where they're putting in storm drains. David goes down to get him. David is shaken. Not Eddie, not his little brother. This could be the start, sniffing, whether it's glue or an aerosol can or what have you. It's just as bad, just as dangerous as the rest of the drug scene. It too can cause permanent damage. It can even kill. There are lots of things David has to tell his brother. Drugs and narcotics not only turn you on, they turn on you. Don't pollute your body and your mind with them. It's your decision. Just remember, there are a thousand reasons why users end up losers. You are looking at a traveler who just bought a ticket for a very special kind of a trip. The cost? A few dollars and his mind, over which he will very shortly have little or no control. Now most of his preparations have been made and he's just about ready to go. He won't have to leave this room if he doesn't want to, but he'll travel so far that he may get lost and never come back. Transportation to the fantastic and frightening territory of inner space, courtesy of the most powerful mind-altering drug ever discovered. Destination unknown, courtesy of SD-25. My full chemical name is dextrolysergic acid diethylamide tartrate 25. But as everyone knows, I'm called LSD for short, though I'm also called acid, and by some highly unflattering names by those who wish I'd never been discovered. Right now, some 200 micrograms of my substance have just entered his body, and already my potent molecules are on their way to his brain, where they will trigger some very special chemistry. And in just a few minutes now, I will show him glimpses of distorted beauty or tumble him into a terrifying private hell. But at just this moment, neither he nor I know the direction or destination of the trip we're about to take together. Round, round, out of your mind You think you're seeing things, I know you're blind A million bright colors explode in your head Today you're just high Round, round, out of your mind. That's right. And as you might imagine, not all of the people who know about me approve of what I am or what I do. These people, for example, have seen my effects and think I'm a total disaster. But they know, too, that I'm part of the scene and that I can be purchased much more easily than you might think. Well, I think it's pretty easy because, uh, well, like this one last night, this one dude walked up and he just handed me something. So I just went ahead and took it. <laughs> you can you can be standing uh, on a street corner and and somebody will approach approach you. It's too easy to get acid. There's too many teeny boppers running around town. I can get acid by simply calling a friend, and I can get as much or as little as I want within a very short amount of time. 
The acid for me is very easy to get. I can get it from anywhere from four blocks to ten blocks from my house in about 20 minutes. See, what did I tell you? Kids know. Of course, I'm not exactly the exclusive property of young people, but kids know a lot about me. More than most older people, for example. They're damaged for life, their brains are wrecked, they go into institutions, they're, they're through for the rest of their life. I've read some silly things about kids falling out of trees and painting themselves green and yellow, and uh, rather stupid to me. It's no good. They're taking it in sugar cubes, it's being dropped into their punch. Well, truthfully, my friend, I know nothing about it. Only what I've read in the paper, what I see on television, and that's about all. We've got to do something about this, don't you think so? But I don't know. I don't know what these people are doing. I've become a favorite topic of conversation almost everywhere. And the mere mention of my three-letter name is enough to send certain writers running to turn out sure-selling articles on how horrible I am. As publishers know, I'm good copy. And since there's so much information and misinformation about me, it's easy to keep the LSD pot boiling. sort of thing is bad for my image as the advertising people say sensational sure fire in the paperbacks but so much of it lacks the saving virtue of truth there hasn't been a case reported yet where I poisoned anyone but speaking frankly a lot of my most ardent supporters are bad for my image too like these three clowns from Southern California who are planning the beginning of something they call Acid City. So that's the scene. Folks like these who love me and think I belong in everyone's breakfast cereal. And way over in the other direction, the Fright Boys with their sure sell magazines and comic books. Things being what they are, you really can't blame me for wanting to put the record straight. It is, as they say, time for the facts. High time. It's hard, really, to put it in word, word form. Uh, you can't really tell a person what it's like unless you've had the experience for yourself. It just, um, well, it's different. Someone like uh, John Glenn trying to explain what he saw in outer space. I mean, it's a very personal thing. It's not easy to describe. No, I'm not easy to describe. I'm a complicated thing, and I'm here in complicated times and in complicated places. But now, let me tell you what I really am and what I really do. Chemically, I look like this. Atoms of oxygen linked with carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Much more complicated than some people seem to think. In fact, the slightest chemical structure may result in profound changes in my potency, as certain black market amateur chemists have found out. Actually, I'm not very spectacular to look at. I'm colorless, odorless, and tasteless. In fact, I'm a kind of a nothing. But I'm one of the most powerful nothings that ever came down the chemical road. Just one of my drops can be enough for 500 average doses. I'm so powerful that I exert an effect in doses smaller than such potent drugs as strychnine or cyanide. My discoverer found that out back in 1943 when he accidentally inhaled a microscopic speck of me and then took to his bed with hallucinations. How can I tell you how really powerful I am? The head of a pin can hold enough of me to send a room full of people out of their minds. A dose for one? The point of a pin holds plenty for a solo trip. Twenty doses can be put under a stamp. An eyedropper can contain enough for 10,000 doses. I'm measured in millionths of a gram called micrograms or gammas. So tiny that even the precision laboratory scales like this can't begin to measure me accurately with just a very few micrograms of me inside the body. Colors, shapes, smells, textures. The whole range of things that can be seen, heard, smelled, touched, and tasted. 
take on incredible distortions which seem absolutely and totally real. With just a few micrograms of me, all sorts of hallucinations are possible. I couldn't see anything except colors, and I thought, well, you know, this is supposed to be reality, but it wasn't. It wasn't anything except just things that weren't objects. You know, after a while, you don't know who you are, and you don't know who the other person is. It's happening, and it's happening so fast, and you can't stop it, and, and you just can't do anything. You just have to, you know, just stay there and, and go through it. With my help, all kinds of things are possible. The most dangerous act can look attractive and easy to accomplish because I can make those sparkling lights look colorful and inviting. A moving tapestry which can beckon and lure a traveler to join them. Well, that's just a rough idea of what a few micrograms of me can do. About the same amount that you saw on the point of the pin. Remember? But in spite of my overwhelming power, I have yet to kill anyone from an overdose. They don't think I'm physiologically addicting. And when I'm swallowed, I disappear because they haven't yet perfected a good field test to detect me inside the body. Altogether, I'm one of the most perplexingly powerful drugs conceivable. Your doctor can't prescribe me. Your druggist can't sell me. And very few scientists are able or willing to test me, and the pharmaceutical companies won't make me. And about the only labs I show up in anymore are the crime labs at police headquarters, because I'm so perplexingly powerful that I'm illegal. But as narcotics officers know so well, I keep showing up, in spite of the laws. Because if you have the right ingredients, I'm not too hard to manufacture. And the black market boys have set up their amateur laboratories in some strategic locations. Like this one, served with a warrant and then raided just a while ago. Amateur acid, made in amateur labs by amateur chemists. When I'm compounded in dirty labs like this, it isn't surprising that I'm often contaminated with other substances. On the consumer level, that means that when an LSD travel agent sells a cap or two, the customer can't trust the label, because there isn't any label. So how do you know what you're getting? You don't know unless you take it, whether it's good or it's bad. You just have to trust your source. Well, when you take it, you find out. <laughs> good acid, bad acid, but always unpredictable acid. I'm around, part of the scene, as I said. But on streets like this, and this, and this, and this. Transactions involving me take place all the time. Illegal, of course, but my tabs and caps and sugar cubes that dissolve in your mind as well as your mouth are selling every day. <laughs> so drop a cap of me and join the mind-expanding world where colors and sounds and smells and tastes and people all take on new dimensions and new qualities. I'm the world's original instant relief drug. Drop a cap of me, man, and drop out. But watch it, because the trip can be a trap, too. You never know where a ticket with me will take you. Let me give you an idea, just the barest idea of what a bum trip can be like. Voices courtesy of those who've been there. Utterly terrifying, utterly powerful, and utterly unpredictable. 
I've even been known to carry a passenger inside the pulsing redness of his own beating heart and leave him there. Oh, most people survive even a really bad trip. And with an injection of one of the most powerful tranquilizers known, they can get safely back to reality. Relax. But not all. Not all. Because, you see, it's true that trippers have injured themselves, sometimes seriously. And one of the most terrifying things of all is true, too. A bum trip's hallucinations can recur at any time in all their original intensity, up to a year after the original dose. Some call it an afterflash, and it's not fun at all. Once I've been swallowed, it's practically impossible to trace me inside the body, so not even the coroner knows how to tell whether or not I was part of this scene twisting the driver's brain cells until he tripped out through the windshield. Hello, Steve Rescue. And it's true that the effects and after effects of bad trips can be so severe that special organizations like San Francisco's LSD Rescue have been set up. This guy knows. He called LSD Rescue 24 hours ago. And he's just about got himself under control now. But for an increasing number of trippers, this too is true. Because the ultimate destination with me can be, and has been, here in the morgue. LSD user hang self. LSD user commit suicide. Yes, it's true. And so, the last voice heard at the ultimate destination can be, and has been, the autopsy surgeons. The body is that of a well-developed, well-nourished teenage male appearing the stated age. Rigor mortis is present throughout, and live ore is present over the dorsal aspects of the body. And so, I'm depressed. And I'm embarrassed because so many of the world's oddballs have adopted me as their special gimmick. I'm too powerful, and I'm too important to join these con artists as part of Acid City. Portrait of a traveler about to take a trip, and his trip is just now starting. He's stuck with me now and what we may do together for the next few hours. I'm not vicious by nature. But I'm not harmless, either. When you tinker with your brain by altering its natural processes with an unknown dose of an unknown drug, you have to take your chances. But curiously enough, the kind of trip he'll take won't depend upon my chemistry as much as his. Because, you see, it's my real secret that I strip away the layers and layers of ego the protective security blanket that shelters you all. And I can bring him into the incredible world of his own deep brain dreamscape. Of course, when he actually gets there, he may be terrified by what he sees. But that's his problem, not mine. It can't happen to me. That's what you said, wasn't it, Bill? But it can and just did, and you're not quite sure why. Let's see if we can find out. Not too many minutes ago, that young woman and her child were happy and healthy. Now their young bodies are crushed and racked with pain. Maybe they'll live and maybe they'll die. But one thing's sure, the next few minutes, hours, or maybe days, their lives will hang in the balance. And you'll have to live out those minutes, hours, and days knowing you were responsible. The police will measure out the skid marks, determine where you applied the brakes, give you a sobriety test, and it will all go into a report that will be reviewed in court. Maybe you'll be found guilty. Maybe you won't. But you'll never outlive the memory of waiting, waiting to find out if the mother and daughter will live or die. Then the police are at you with questions. Where had you been? Had you been drinking? Would you submit to a sobriety test? Sure, why not? After all, you'd only had a few beers. You're not drunk. Of course you're not drunk. 
not in the common sense of the word, but your driving ability was measurably impaired. How could it be? You feel fine. But what you didn't know was that it only takes a few beers to take the keen edge off your driving performance and slow your reaction time. When ethyl alcohol, which is the foundation of all liquor, enters the circulatory system through the stomach, it's oxidized by the liver and turned into heat energy in the form of calories. Unfortunately, the liver can only process about three-eighths of an ounce of alcohol per hour. That's about the amount and three-quarters of a shot glass of whiskey or a short beer. When more alcohol is taken, the liver is unable to process it, and it passes into the bloodstream and is carried to all parts of the body. As the percentage of alcohol begins to build up in the bloodstream, the first part of your nervous system to be affected is your judgment center, located in the frontal lobe of the brain. This is the area of the brain that determines right from wrong. You see, alcohol is not a stimulant. It's a sedative, a depressant. Oh, sure, the first few drinks make you feel more alive and responsive, but actually, as the alcohol enters the bloodstream, it slows down normal operation of the heart and nerve centers and depresses the inhibitory mechanisms of the brain. It removes inhibitions and social restraints. This is what gives us the feeling of stimulation. You have more assurance, but less self-control. It may start innocently enough, a few beers with the gang. It is a social custom of our time. But today, that social custom is invading our society at a younger age than ever before. The few drinks that the social drinker may take don't seem to present a serious danger. But the trouble with drinking and driving is that it is always too late when the emergency arises and our reactions are too slow to avoid disaster. It is readily agreed by authorities and tests that driving skills are to a degree a matter of habit build up over long periods of practice. It has also been proven that the latest driving skills mastered are the first to go when under the influence of liquor. Therefore, the older, more experienced driver is less likely to have his skills seriously impaired than the younger, less experienced driver. One must be able to judge speed and distance, follow traffic patterns, make necessary adjustments, and be able to react quickly to emergencies. After a few drinks, the good driver is no longer capable of doing this. He has become a poor driver and is a danger to himself and others. This happened to you, didn't it, Bill? Sure, you passed your sobriety test. They can't convict you on drunk driving, can they? But you'll always have to face the fact that those beach party beers were a contributing factor in your accident. If you hadn't had them, you might have hit the brake pedal a second or two earlier. Those skid marks on the asphalt would have stopped on the right side, not the wrong side of that young woman and her daughter. The report just came through. The little girl died on the way to the hospital, and the mother will probably never walk again. No matter how your trial comes out, you'll always have to live with those facts, won't you, Bill? A child dead, a mother crippled. Not a pleasant future to face at the age of 18, they come in all different shapes and sizes and range in age from teeny boppers to 19 year olds but just like in the old days teenagers have always shared one thing in common they've always found a unique way to express themselves as individuals and this of course would be called a group self-expression Today, just like always, clothes have been the groovy way of really expressing yourself. And teenagers can always be counted on to do something very original and uh, very self-expressive. There's some girls who express themselves in a simple look. Others do so in highly feminized slacks. And for hemlines, well, this may be the long and short of it. But how much shorter can a skirt get? has always been very important. Yes, even with boys. It's been very short and even longer than the Beatles. But girls have always had a lot more ways to express themselves through their hair. Why, they could change its color completely. 
And they can even simplify the entire thing and just go out to a store and buy some hair in any color they like. They can curl it. They can wave it. And they can even iron it so it comes out nice and straight, uh, split ends and all. Certain hairstyles may make it necessary to take a good look to see which is the girl and which is the boy. But that's not true for all boys, especially for those who are trying so desperately to prove their manhood. However, the more personal, the more individual way to prove your manhood was to play chicken. And at one time, a chicken run was considered the best way to prove manhood, dead or alive. For girls, the matter of being chicken and proving yourself as a woman is still frequently based on accepting this kind of dare from a so-called friend. As even adults admit it, growing up isn't easy, especially if you try to keep up with the dares and fads of some of your more advanced friends. Two of the more advanced fads have to do with drugs. So why do you want to be down when you can be up? Please just try it once, okay? Now there's a brief argument for you. Why, with the help of a good, kind friend, you can be turned on, make the scene, blow grass, smoke reefers, or pot joints, or Mary Janes. Uh, those are just a few of the cool, uh, groovy names for marijuana. And if grass doesn't make it for you, baby, and especially if you need to be in, well, you can always drop a camp of acid. Now, that's the real stuff. Very, very cool. Very, very groovy. <laughs> now, everybody who takes it admits that there's always the risk of a bad trip, a bummer, a freak out, even a flip out. But why be lame, baby? Give yourself a real kick. Yes, a kick in the head. head, 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 head. What do America's leading scientists, doctors, and psychiatrists working with people taking LSD say? As we see it from a typical psychiatric ward, LSD is certainly much more than a mere fad. Right now, we have over a dozen people hospitalized because of acute symptoms resulting directly from their taking LSD. Bizarre fatal accidents and suicides have also occurred in LSD's users. Because of this, we say, that LSD is not just a fad. People are seriously disturbed, some even dead. It all began in a laboratory very much like this one. In 1938, Dr. Albert Hoffman in Switzerland was looking for new drugs in the treatment of migraine headaches. He had been studying substances that came from the molds that grow on rye plants. Now, it turned out that these substances were of no use in the treatment of migraine headaches but subsequent investigation showed that they are very fascinating indeed in the changes that they produce in our mental state. Normal people react to LSD by seeing strange patterns of wildly moving color. And at other times, the subject may recall with terrifying detail incidents that are long, long forgotten. At the 
the same time, there is often a loss of the normal cause and effect relationships of things going on in the environment. And this leads to distortion of judgment. Nevertheless, in spite of the risks, the word was out. LSD was it. One pill and all unhappiness would vanish. The real meaning of existence would become quickly clear. Such nonsense. Parents, deprived of LSD, did not understand. Many wild and very unscientific claims have been made about LSD. I've spoken to a large number of young people, asking them, why do you take LSD? I took it this Yeah, he's something that, that's right inside you that you're experiencing now. I took LSD for a kick. Man, LSD stimulates creativity in the brain. In other words, it uh, expands your, your thought processes so that you can take in more. We gave a series of 50 tests to people before and after LSD. We found that at the end of six months following their LSD taking, that they were no more creative when we measured them than they were before they took the LSD. However, their feeling, their inner feeling of subjective creativity was there. This means, perhaps, that they may have an impression of creativity, but not creativity itself. Creativity is 90% perspiration and only 10% inspiration. And LSD doesn't enhance one's desire to perspire. LSD is a, is a really groovy way to find out more about the things around you. LSD helps me understand the whole world better. LSD helps you to understand your own mind. It releases your mind to you. LSD is a way about finding out about yourself. While there are many things that we don't know about LSD, there are a few that we do know. And perhaps the most important one that we do know is that it is absolutely unpredictable who will have a bad experience from LSD or when they will have it. Some people have a bad experience the first time they take the drug. Others take it 30, 60, or even 100 times before their bad trip. And the bad trip, instant insanity, often a never-never land of no return. This girl is obviously acutely disturbed. She will be in the hospital for a few weeks or a few months. The chances are that she will get well again, at least well enough to leave the ward. Whether she will ever be the same again, have the same personality, the same ambitions, the same abilities to work, to love, to get along with other people, that we won't know for a long time. Some others who take LSD will have even more tragic freakouts. And there's no way to tell which ones these will be. Men lose all reality. And in a turn or euphoric seat, step up to fly from cliffs and high windows with real life, permanent, non-psychedelic results. Other trippers attempt to merge their beings with large, fast automobiles. Unfortunate, not because LSD is wicked or sinful of itself, but because it is such an extremely dangerous drug. A drug whose effects are so unpredictable. A drug which so often causes severe, long-lasting damage. It's up to you. Taking LSD 
is much the same as playing Russian roulette. You spin the barrel with the one bullet in it, and you take a chance. Any one shot or several. Maybe an exciting and harmless kick. But each time you try, the odds keep growing against you. Until, until that final kick. It's up to you. If I can make an impression on one, just one of you kids that's here, that's really all I want. Because if somebody somewhere had made an impression on me, maybe I wouldn't have done it. This is Flory Fisher's story told in her own you know, words to a group of New York City high school time, students typical of teenagers across the country. But I'm, I'm very it's not a pretty story. This group here, and it's a story of heartbreak and hell. That I would like it's a story of 23 first, wasted years in the life of a drug addict. A 17 of those years behind bars. It's now, a true Mr. story. Silverman said something wrong. He said I was a drug addict. Well, I was not a drug addict. I am a drug addict. I haven't used anything in over four years, but I never forget that I am a drug addict. And I want to thank you very, very much for letting me talk to you, because this is my lifeline. I have to talk about it every day. You know, I'll be very honest with you. I never have days that I'm just completely like everybody else. Every time my mother aggravates me and she's 80 years old and my dad's 89 and God bless him, they aggravate the hell out of me. You know, I say, oh, I wish I could get high. But it's a feeling that I have inside. Gut level, I'd like to be high. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's a great feeling. You smoke marijuana and it's great. You go further than that, it's even greater. Gut level, I like that feeling, but intellectually, I now know that I can't smoke one stick of pot. I can't take one snort of horse. I can't take one needle of cocaine because I am an addictive personality. And that's all I need is one of anything. You know, I need one dress. If I happen to like this dress in tan, I buy the same dress in green and black and pink. This is the type of personality I am. The world is full of it. Now, I know you kids, in order to have the ends justify the means, have read, have talked, have heard, marijuana is not addictive. Well, that's true. Marijuana is not addictive. The doctors are telling you the truth. Marijuana is not physically addictive. But it is so psychologically addictive that you cannot. And uh, before I go any further, I'll tell you, people say, give me statistics. The hell with statistics. I don't want a piece of paper with numbers on it. I am unto myself a statistic, the only statistic I need. Along with me, 23 years of living with nothing but gutter hypes and junkies. I have thousands of friends, if you will. They're all junkies, and there isn't one, not one, who didn't start smoking marijuana. Now, I've talked to kids and they say, well, Ms. Fisher, your talk is not pertinent to me because my culture is just smoking marijuana. Well, you know what? My culture just smoked marijuana until we got on horse. And, you know, you're young. You know, you're beautiful with young youth. And along with young youth comes the curiosity of young youth. And if you smoke a stick of pot and you feel good, who here can tell me that if somebody says, man, that was a gas, you ain't lived until you took a snort of horse. Don't you want to try it? You know it can't happen to you. You're not going to get hooked with one shot, and you're not going to get hooked with one shot, and you over there with the beads on, you're not going to get hooked with one shot. But it only takes one shot to take a second shot, and that second shot goes into a third, and then you get like me. You start needing $185 a day, and you know what? The bank presidents don't have that kind of money at their command. So now, here I am. I'm a girl from a nice middle to upper class Jewish family. I have a sister and brother who are the pillars of society. I'm the baby. I was very much loved by my parents. I won't go into it now, but I 
you know, I blame my mother and father for loving me too much. I lied. From the time I could talk, I was a pathological liar. And all of this was a lead up into my addictive personality. Now, I was in the country, in the Jewish cat schools, and I met a, what you call a hippie now, was a zoot zooter then, you know, the whole bit with the peg pants, the long jacket, and the swinging uh, keychain, the mustache and the sideburn. And I thought he was just gorgeous. And I conned my mother into going home and letting me stay at a girlfriend whose parents had their own little place in, in the mountains. So I spent the weekend with this guy, and he was smoking marijuana. And I thought he was just so marvelous. Anything he wanted to do, I wanted to identify with him, and I did it. Never heard of marijuana before. And incidentally, you school kids, don't think, well, education. You know, I'm a college graduate. It doesn't matter. It, 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 it drug, drug, marijuana, a rose by any other name. Well, drug is the most negative working thing that I have ever met. It sucks every part of you up in a negative way. Now, you all sit complacently. It can happen to you. It can and it will. You girls, you Negroes, I don't know whether you live in Harlem, but I know a Harlem that you kids don't know. You know, I know a Harlem where I laid on Dope Street. I'm sure it's still Dope Street, 117th Street. I know the sports bar is closed. I know all these places. I copped there. All the cocaine, all the caps, all the, the $25 half loads and the $50 bundles. I copped from everybody. And there I was, sleeping in a bathroom, nodding out where any man could make me his prey. And you know what? It wouldn't make any difference, because I didn't know. I was zonked. I didn't have to do this. This is something drugs led me to. Now, I married a man, this boy. You know, he smoked marijuana. This was his only crime. He was a young kid. He had two years of college. And you know what I did? I made a pimp out of him, an 18-carat pimp. I was a call girl. I was young, I was fly, I was pretty, and I was out selling my body. Kept going to jail, and you know, 10 years later, I had to be $10 cheaper, and I wasn't a call girl. I became a madam. Then I became a street whore. Then I've been in every department store. My mug is in every uh, post office. It isn't now, thank God, but it was. But there was no place that I could go, and I kept going to jail. I was busted three months after I got my first habit, and I was sentenced to one to three years, that's pen and death, in the house of detention in Greenwich Village. I'm sure you all know where it was. And I spent 24 months there on my first offense for possession of a needle. I came out, and what do you do? You know, you're hooked. Psychologically, you're hooked. You're in jail, you're out jail. You're using. If you're not, you're thinking of how quickly you can use and when. You know, every day that I spent in jail, I dreamt about the time I could cook my breakfast up in a teaspoon. And I'm sure every one of you have been exposed to that type of talk. This is a shot of heroin. Now, I came out of jail, I went back to jail. I came out of jail, I went back to jail. I've done four years five years. In the house of detention, I have 12 years racked up in 30 days, in 90 days, in a year, in three years. I have four years in Bedford. I was in uh, Rayford, and I did a year. I came out, and in 1955, I got married, October 16th. And on my honeymoon, two days later, in Key West, I was busted. And uh, I went to jail for four years. Well, in all that time, my husband and I, the only lovemaking we ever did was our letter once a week where we swore on dying love. You know, I haven't seen my husband. I came out, he met me, and it kind of dissipated itself. It's not important. But the thing is, there was my life. And you know something? I know that every one of you kids feel great. You know, she's 50 years old. How does she identify with you? I do identify with you. You know why? I'm a 50-year-old hippie. I think exactly like you think. The only thing is you think it, and I have thought it, done it, acted upon it, and suffered by it. Now, you know, you can be smart or you can be stupid. And I tell you, if you smoke marijuana, if you take speed, if you use any exhilarant or any depressant, you're foolish because you can't get away with it. I assure you, I'm a pretty smart cookie. You know, I was a confidence woman. I built people all over the country. I, I'm by any standard smart. The only thing is, I wasn't smart with dope. I couldn't handle it. And there's nobody in the world that can handle it. Now, I can't tell you not to do it, 
But I can suggest to you, believe it, you're your brother's keeper. And I know the code of the streets goes for even the squares. You don't want to tell. You know, you don't want to be a rat fink. But you want to know something? You've got to be a rat fink. If you don't want to put your name down, let me tell you something. If I had a friend who was smoking marijuana and I knew it, I wouldn't say, hey, Jake, I'm going to tell on you. I would take his name, take his address, say he's smoking pot, and to use the expression of the streets, I'd drop a dime on him. I'd put a 10-cent stamp in an envelope, put his name and address on it, and drop it in the mailbox. Somebody will take it up from there. But you have to do it. If somebody did it to me, I wouldn't be here talking to you like this. I have a father who's still living. I have a mother who's still living. Do you think this is easy for me? My name is splashed all over the papers. I'll be on TV, national network. Do you think they like it? They don't like it, but they're proud of me now. And with their old European wisdom, they said, well, your name was splashed all over the papers every time you got busted. You know, at least now your nose is clean and you're doing something. And this is how I kind of feel. Maybe I'll use the word missionary. If I can make an impression on one, just one of you kids that's here, that's really all I want. Because if somebody somewhere had made an impression on me, maybe, I, you know, I wouldn't have done it. Now, I was talking at Norland High. And you know what? In an auditorium that had 2,500 seats, in a school that had almost 3,000 students, and I assume every one of these students had at least one parent, 50 parents showed up. They didn't give a damn about their kids. And you know something? I really, you know, maybe I'm saying the wrong thing. I don't expect too much of you kids. How the hell can they expect you to care when your mother and father don't care? And they have to care because they're the ones that have to recognize it. And I know you all talk. Sure, you hear, they're taking dope. Their pupils are pinpoints. They're on the nod. They're hanging over there. Their, their nose is down to the floor. That's fine. You're taking morphine or you're taking heroin. But what about the mother who says, I don't believe it. I told my daughter to do the bedroom and she's cleaning the whole house. Isn't this marvelous? She's just abounding with energy. Well, nine chances out of ten, she's abounding with methadrine, speed. Dizoxin, amphetamine, cocaine, these are exhilarants. And if a mother is looking for pinpointed pupils, she won't find them. She'll find big, black, dilated pupils. But if she doesn't know, what can she do about it? If a kid comes home and says, Mama, I'm sleeping over Jack's house, and Mama calls up and he's not at Jack's house, so what? So he comes home and says, Oh, Mama, I, I, I said Jack, but I really meant Jim. Well. He's not telling the truth. He was out getting high, stealing a car, laying out on the beach, smoking pot. And to use an old Jewish cliche, from this comes the worst diseases. Nobody can get away with it. And you say, I repeat, be a rat fink. How the hell can I be a rat fink? How can I get my friend picked up? Why can't you get your friend picked up for psychiatric help? If you don't get him picked up today, next year he's going to be busted. And you know what? In Florida, for instance, where I am now, it is a mandatory five-year sentence in the penitentiary for possession of one stick of pot. Now, they say, if you legalize it, that would take away the intrigue. That would take away the cabal, you know, the black market. It isn't so. You know what you have in England? It's legalized there. So you have people standing online waiting for the, the drugstore to open up. And what do they do there? They open up, they sell them the stuff, and they go into the park, like Washington Park or Gramercy Park, and they sit there in broad daylight fixing a shot and taking it, and in front of them is five little kids, maybe two, four, six, and eight. Mister, what are you doing? So here you're going to grow into a society of kids who have been exposed to mainline narcotic shooting from the time they were able to walk. What can they possibly grow into? All of you people who say, LSD, okay, if you're emotionally stable, you know, it, it doesn't give you a bad trip. It's a lie. I was thrown from a horse and I had a laminectomy and I ended up in the San Francisco General Hospital. I was operated on by the same doctor who operated on the late Jane Mansfield's son, Zoltan, when he was mauled by the line. Well, while I was there, they brought in a straight B student, 21-year-old, 
girl from the University of Southern California. She was part Negro, part Spanish, and part Indian. And believe me, she had the beauty of all three. Well, when I saw her, she was in the psychiatric ward. She had taken a trip on LSD, and it was devastating. They committed her to the psychiatric ward on the sixth floor. One of her college buddies came to visit her and bought her a cube of sugar, which had LSD in it, and she decided to escape. The avenue of escape she used was to go out the sixth floor window. How was she going to do that? She took one sheet, and even on a king-size bed, I'm sure you all have an idea of the length of a sheet. With that length, she had to tie it to the bedpost, and she lowered herself out the sixth floor. So, of course, she dropped five stories. When I saw her, she was on a striker frame. If any of you remember when Kennedy broke his back, it looks like a long spit. Your head is held immobile by two ice prongs. Your feet are tied by traction. And every two hours, they turn you over. This girl's neck was broken in six places. Now, they, I found out since that they fused her spine in her neck. And she will always be stiff. But it doesn't make any difference because she is a raving maniac. And her prognosis is nil. Now, this is LSD. And I know doctors. And I know lawyers. And I never know the most stable people in the the world that have taken trips on LSD and are still waiting to return. Now remember that well, please. And you must forgive me. I talk off the top and as something comes to my mind, I repeat it. Let me repeat something to you that I know every one of you kids will identify with. Damn it, I did this or damn it, I did that. My older brother was always bugging me. My sister was always bugging me. My mother and father are always telling me what to do. So great. Rebel. By all means, rebel and start using pills, start using goofballs, start using marijuana, start using horse, and then go to jail. And then you know what? You go into a place like I went to, Rayford, Florida State Penitentiary, where you're thrown into a sardine can, where you eat and you sleep and you mess on the floor and you lay naked for male and female guards to check up on you, and in the morning, because the smell is ridiculous, they hose you out with a power hose. You're told when to eat, what to eat, how to eat, and what do you eat? Beans and, 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 and cornbread in the afternoon, coffee and, and, and grits in the morning, and rice and hogshead cheese in the night, every day, from Monday to Sunday. This is what you get. You have no pride. You have no respect. You're stripped of every vestige of anything that you were given by God. Is that what you want? That's what you'll get. You can't get away with it. Because I repeat, I'm pretty smart. And I couldn't get away with it. And I am trying my darndest to go all over the country. I work. I work for $52 a week in a house for retarded children. Because my thing now is I have to help people. I was helped, and I'll tell you how I was helped. I was in the house of detention right here doing a six-month sentence for being an habitual user. Well, I did my five months and I think 20 days, and I was being released the following week. I looked outside, you know, you see 10th, 10th Avenue or 6th Avenue in Greenwich, and I said, good God, I have to go out in the street and come up against all these squares, maybe get in a cab or get in a, a bus or a taxi and see these damn squares. And I'm not going to be high. I can't do it. So I sent out to my connection. I said, would you please meet me with a shot? I can't make the street scene with the squares. I got to be loaded. I was a good customer, you know, $185 a day habit. So he met me in the rotunda of the house of detention with a shot. I went into the phone booth, and right through my dress, I took that shot. Unfortunately, one of the matrons wanted to make a phone call, and she walked in and busted me. And without ever hitting the street, I was rearrested and got another six months as a user. So there I was doing a year without ever hitting the street. Well, uh, I don't say God is dead. I only say that for many, many years, we weren't on speaking terms. But this particular day, Somebody was up there, and he happened to like me because he, while I was looking for something else in a, in a magazine, I stumbled on Synanon. And then that man upstairs who liked me finally gave me a little tip and booted me. And I wrote a pathetic letter saying, I'm 46 years old, been coming to jail for 18 years, been using stuff for 23 years. Obviously, I need help. Obviously, I can't help myself. Won't you please help me? The lawyer for Synanon came into the House of Detention, and February 
11th, 1964, when I was released. There are many clinics here. They are all imitations of Synanon. If you kids have a problem, I don't say go in and join. Go in and find out what it's all about, because all the people there have, in one way or another, identified with me. They can help you. You kids need help. I assume this is your teacher. Don't be afraid. She's only there to help you. Tell her, get up enough moxie to go and say, I did something, I'm afraid, help me. Jail is not the answer. No prison hospital is the answer. Help, identification, and talking to people who have been there and been through it. That's the only way. You have to learn how to ask for help. People will help you, but they can't help you unless they know you need help, and they can't know you need help if you don't ask for it. Learn how to ask for help. You need it. It took me 23 years, but I learned how to ask for help. I was helped, and I'm trying to help you. Wherever she goes, Flory is interested in the comments and questions of young people who have heard her story. Here is a sample of some of the questions asked by these New York City teenagers and her answers. We'll answer your questions. Well, I have a question. Don't you think you're being a bit presumptuous with us? You, you're, uh, first of all, you said that you considered us hippies. What's your connotation for hippies? Because uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think any of us are really hippies here. Well, now, fine. I don't think anybody really ah. My little catalyst here. You're playing devil's advocate. I love that. Well, I use the word hippie merely for the purposes of identification. What I was trying to say, I'll tell you exactly how it is. I was about 21 when I started using stuff. When I finally got into Synanon at the tender age of 46, I thought I was 21. You know, the false eyelashes, which I still wear, but I don't wear the mascara with it. I don't wear tight dresses. I wore dresses shorter than you kids. I really thought I was 21. My, my growing processes stopped. You know, and I, I said hippie merely because it's a word that's very much in the, uh, you know, in, in the papers, on everybody's lips today. But I don't think, and it's, well, let me say this. I, say, I don't think I'm being presumptuous. I know I am not being presumptuous. You know why? All these thousands of junkies that I have known in my 23 years of hell were kids exactly like you. I, I'm exactly like you are. I was. Well, I have another question. Please. Uh, you made it seem obvious that anyone who takes drugs or, let's say, marijuana is seeking, is, is seeking some kind of uh, mind satisfaction or that they have worries. And then you, and you also stated that they need psychiatric help. I don't think anybody who, I don't think it's necessarily true that anyone who tries pot needs psychiatric help because uh, marijuana is very much like cigarettes. You have many kids right here in this audience who sit down and smoke or who drink occasionally. And I think they need, if, if a pot smoker needs uh, psychiatric help, they need just as much psychiatric help as any other pot smoker. You know, I have been generalizing all along, but I guess in your case, I have to individualize. There are some people that I know who only smoke marijuana, never graduated to heroin. This is what you're saying, right? I mean, you say some of them smoke and don't need psychiatric help. Well, I have six people that I counted friends who use marijuana, and they, true, they never did graduate to heroin. You know why? because on marijuana, they committed crimes of passion and were electrocuted before they got a chance to get hooked on horse. Now, that's anything I tell you is factual. They were electrocuted in the electric chair at Rayford and at Sing Sing for a murder that they committed while using marijuana. Now, I repeat, you want to individualize? Yes, I'm sure I can find people who tried, you know, nor does he know until he has tried one stick of pot and didn't get anything in it. And, and he stopped. I also know kids in Florida who smoked oregano. And anybody who cooks knows it's just a herb. And they got a little dizzy or they got a little bit of taste. And man, this is the end. You don't know what the hell you're doing. Somebody gives you anything, catnip, you know, thyme, and rolls it up in a cigarette and you think you got high on it. That's how psychological it is. And I repeat, if you smoke marijuana, you know, if you think about smoking marijuana, there's something wrong upstairs and you do need a little psychiatric help. Now, how much you need might be contingent on how, uh, whether you continue. There are some people who take one stick and don't do it again. But there are very, very few. And I wouldn't count on being one of the lucky ones. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Did you ever get yellow, dog? 
You ever join this? Mm, about six times. Yellow jaundice is a, a disease, it's a liver disease. You turn yellow, you know, your eyeballs are yellow instead of bloodshot red. And uh, it comes from a dirty needle, using somebody, using a needle that somebody else used, and possibly there's a drop of blood in it that intermingles. And uh, it's a very devastating disease. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, dear. Well, you said six times. Yeah. Well, from my experience, I would say that if each of us dropped a dime on, on every one of our friends that we knew was using it. Would it would eventually get back to you? No, no. <laughs> That's not, I would say that about 85% of our friends would be, you know, if they knock up something. Like what that, does say. that tell you? You sit here and you call me presumptuous, you would say, and you know, we'll take it as a, a, a off the top statistic, 85% of your friends would be, there you go. Well, think about it. Think about it. If somebody doesn't drop a dime on them, you're going to be the lucky girl who has to write 85% of your letters to kids in one jail or another, because you count them friends. Drop a dime on them. Somebody will take it up. Somebody somewhere will take it up. Wouldn't you rather help them now than have to write to them and send them packages? Wouldn't you rather help them now where they get help and not the stigma of a, a criminal record? Think about it. You are your brother's keeper. You must remember that. You are your brother's keeper. Help them. You contend that the use of uh, hard drugs started with you. Because In an interview following her talk, Flory Fisher was asked about her first trip back to New York City after she gave up using drugs and the things she saw that made her realize what she had escaped. That's right. I came uh, back to New York on a sales trip for Synanon in September. And Synanon is at 35 uh, Riverside Drive, which I believe is 75th Street. And I walked up from 75th Street to 96th Street on Broadway. This is the area that I hustled, that I bought dope, that I sold dope, that I slept 24 hours a day. And I was frightened to death. I just didn't believe it. I saw women that I had known 10 years before that were young, beautiful girls, and they were walking down the street with run-over shoes that didn't have heels, skirts that were pinned together, hanging, almost nothing on top, filthy, dirty, and every part of their exposed arms and legs had running abscesses that I recognized were from, you know, dirty needles and bad stuff. And it frightened me so that uh, I had decided to walk up and walk back with a good sense to be as scared as I was. I snatched a cab and I ran back to the sanctity of my home. And isn't until we have an accident that we seriously ask ourselves why we had that extra drink.